welcome. Welcome everyone to the international uh, technical webinar on sustainable uh, food value chains for nutrition. Uh, this is one of the series of webinars that the FAO eLearning Academy organizes together with Agrinium and uh, the United Nations uh, Economic and uh, uh, Social uh, um, Committee for the Pacific. Um, these, with these technical webinars, what we are trying to do is to cover the main priority uh, technical areas uh, to allow us to better face the challenges humanity is faced with. So the various thematic areas are uh, climate change, uh, crop production, water management, uh, but uh, of course also uh, sustainability, uh, nutrition, trade. So we are trying to cover the, these various uh, thematic areas. There is one common thread, however, through all the webinars, which is sustainability. Of course, everything we do is aligned with the uh, SDG uh, Agenda 2030. And um, we, we try to gather experts throughout the world uh, that, that can share with us uh, their knowledge. The other point I wanted to mention is that all these webinars um, cover thematic areas that are covered uh, in the FAO e-learning courses that are offered free of charge through the FAO e-learning academy and everything is offered as a global public good. So you will be able to find the courses but also all the webinars on uh, elearning.fao.org. It's very simple and there you can access all the recordings of the previous webinars as well as access to uh, free access to the multilingual uh, e-learning courses. So uh, today we have a very special program for you. Uh, we are uh, extremely pleased to have with us uh, Mrs. Florence Tortanac, uh, which is one of my colleagues from FAO. We also have uh, with us uh, James Garrett from the Alliance of uh, Biodiversity and SIA. Uh, we will also uh, be hearing uh, about a country case study from Mozambique uh, with um, uh, Custodio uh, Mukavele from IFAD and Carla Homwana from Cromer. So uh, the program is e extremely rich and I would like to start by giving the floor to uh, Florence, uh, uh, Florence, the floor is yours. You have 10 minutes. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Christina, for this introduction. So I will start by sharing my screen. So give me um, one minute. Okay, here it is. Yes, thank you very much, uh, Christina, for uh, this introduction and for organizing uh, uh, this uh, webinar for the launching of uh, this uh, e-learning course on sustainable food value chains for nutrition. So first I will give a little background of this course. Uh, so for, for us, as you know, in FAO, nutrition is at the heart of the agenda of uh, 2030 for sustainable development. And uh, not only in terms of the SDG targets, uh, but also in terms of the importance of good nutrition as a key input to achieve each and every SDG. And with the proclam proclamation of the UN Decade of Action on Nutrition by the UN uh, General Assembly in uh, 2016, there is a unique opportunity to governments and uh, development community to work together on nutrition. Also, uh, next year, the UN will convene as a food system summit uh, that will awake the work to the fact that uh, we all must work together to transform the way the food is, uh, pro uh, the world produce, consume, and thinks about food. And uh, we, we have to be on track with the DG and we really need uh, to transform the food systems. And to do it, we need to work all together. So this is uh, what uh, our vision, uh, sorry, this, uh, this slide is a little crowdy, but you may know it already. The framework is a framework of the 
uh, uh, food system from the HLP, uh, the high level panel of experts of the CFS, no, the World Com Committee of Food Security. And uh, where we, we, we see where our entry point is really on the left side on the food supply chain. And uh, we, we really need to take into consideration not only the food produced, but also how it is processed, distributed, marketed, and consumed. And it's also necessary to unpack the complexity of the food system and to identify entry points for policy, investment, and capacity development. So even if uh, value chain intervention have historically focused on increasing economic returns, they also play an important role in shaping food system as, as they influence both the food supply, but also the demand. And we also uh, taking care of the food environment and the consumer uh, behavior, which has a free um, topic that we are highlighting here. So by promoting nutrition sensitive value chain is one way of maximizing the contribution of sustainable agriculture to improve nutrition. So this is the basis uh, of, for us. Uh, uh, so against this uh, background, we, we realized uh, that uh, the collaboration with, uh, between uh, UN agencies, both at global and also at country level, is really crucial to achieving a food system which delivers diverse and nutritious food. And having, uh, we identified the sustainable food value chain for nutrition as a key area of collaboration forming a, a working group on the topic uh, for nutrition, bringing to, together FAO, IFAD, WFP, but also Bioversity International, now called the Alliance uh, of Bioversity International and SEAT, and also IFPRI. And the group was created to uh, undertake joint action in the area of uh, sustainable food value chain for nutrition including support to investment and policy processes, capacity development, generation of knowledge products, harmonized uh, tools and guidance, and joint advocacy, all in the context of country-led processes and international policy forum. So the, the key activities of this working group, which started in 2015, uh, was really to, to first uh, agree on a framework, on a common framework for, for sustainable food value chain for nutrition, and then to, to diffuse it and to use it in different fora. So we organized a, a special event during the Committee of World Food Security, CFS, in a plenary meeting held in Rome in 2016. And uh, we presented the framework with particular attention to sustainability and inclusivity. Uh, and also a summary paper document was published uh, by uh, CFS. And uh, the framework was also presented in several events like a UN uh, an, an event organized by the UN expert group meeting on sustainable food value chain development, also uh, held in Rome in uh, 2016, and the UN uh, Standing Committee on Nutrition uh, organized an event uh, on um, trade and nutrition. We also organized um, online consultation through uh, the Food Security and Nutrition Forum for uh, disseminating and validating uh, the framework that uh, we put together and uh, to discuss it with development practitioners and researchers and get their feedback about the relevance of the framework. And drawing on uh, the existing value chain approaches, we adopted a common approach to guide efforts of different agencies to mainstream nutrition into value chain projects. So the, uh, the framework represents a shift from the traditional value chain approach, which focuses on su supply opportunities and market demands to one that starts with understanding the nutrition needs of consumers. 
we will have more detail later with the presentation on, of, on James about this. We also um, continuing the activities that uh, the group has done. So in 2018, IFAD published uh, a, a big uh, publication about the topic on nutrition sensitive value chain, a guide, a guide for project design. And the same year also under WFP leadership, uh, there was a publication of uh, what we call homegrown school feeding resource framework, which is also applying a nutrition sensitive value chain um, uh, approach. In 2019, we started to, to implement several activities and projects with government uh, at country level. And uh, now, so we are launching this uh, uh, e-learning course that was done uh, jointly with all the partners, you know, the free ADAs plus Biodiversity International and SEAT and IFPRI uh, for uh, all the participants and everybody interested in the topic. So the, the course is uh, primarily targets uh, development uh, practitioners and policy makers who are working on the development of sustainable food system. He also, the course also benefits those interested in learning more about sustainable food system and food system thinking, including extension agent, researchers, and the private sector. So for us, the course is both for a nutritionist who would like to know how to uh, um, approach nutrition with a value chain approach, so people who know about nutrition but do not know about value chain, but also on the other way around, people that are experts in value chain, how to introduce nutrition in the work they are doing on value chain. So it's very important to have uh, this, uh, these two um, ways of looking at, uh, at value chain uh, with this course. So the main topics of the course are first uh, the key concept, uh, of uh, the topic of sustainable food value chain for nutrition, including diet and nutrition, and also some definitions about value chain and their sustainability. Then we are moving to the elements of the analytical framework, including potential strategies and entry point for interventions. Then we are going to the free impact pathway by which a sustainable food value chain can improve nutrition and then the process of developing this kind of uh, project, including analysis and identification of commodities and interventions. Also, just to mention uh, at the end of this course, uh, for people who are taking it, there is a possibility to obtain a digital badge certification offered by the FAO eLearning Academy, uh, bypassing the final performance evaluation. So you will get uh, now more in, um, details about the course itself. I am including also in the presentation a small list of uh, resources, key resources that could be useful to go uh, further in the topic. And uh, so I will uh, leave it uh, here and uh, uh, we'll uh, let uh, James to develop and uh, explain more in detail as an approach and, uh, and, and uh, the content of the course. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you very much, uh, Florence. I just wanted to add the, just a few details about the certification. So uh, the FAO eLearning and in eLearning Academy is now also um, a legal certifying body. So we are able to certify the acquisition of competences acquired through the courses. And as Florence was mentioning, uh, there is a, a, a final test uh, that is um, associated with the with the with the course. So uh, so uh, if you pass this scenario based test, you have access to uh, to the to the digital badge that certifies your your competencies. So now I would like to give the floor to uh, to James Garrett. Uh, James, the floor is yours. You have twenty minutes. Thank you. Um, great. Need to go to.
Great, thank you, Christina. Uh, and thank you very much, Florence, also for the, for the introduction. I wanna say first, welcome to everyone. And thank you for really coming from all over the world to join us today. Uh, and it's really nice to see um, friends and colleagues also online. So what I want to do now is to present an overview of the course, not specifically uh, about all the content, but what you'll find when you open up the course and what you'll find inside. So as Florence suggested, who should actually take this course? First, the course, the course aims, as Florence said, to provide project designers and managers with the concepts, principles and tools they need to leverage value chain approaches through agriculture and importantly food systems and to design sustainable food value chains for nutrition or sometimes what I'll refer to as SFF, SFVCN projects. The course itself has four lessons. The first lesson introduces the key concepts related to food systems and value chains, nutrition and sustainability, and the relationships between them. It also emphasizes the importance of a multi-sectoral approach to nutrition and the components of a healthy diet. The second lesson introduces the concepts and framework for sustainable food value chains for nutrition and it explores how to apply the lenses of nutrition and sustainability when thinking about value chains and value chain projects. It notes that the starting point is to understand the nutrition problem of the target population and to consider then how to address that problem. The three main strategies of how to do this include how to increase supply or how to increase demand for nutritious foods, or how to improve the nutrition value of the foods themselves, including attention to food loss and waste. These are the very, there are various entry points and actions on how to do this that we show in the slide on the right, which is the framework itself, strategies and entry points. And it also distinguishes between, for example, typical value chain entry points, which are in green, and the nutrition sensitive or the sustainable food value for nutrition sensitive entry points, which add the nutrition lens for a, a typical value chain. of nutritious foods in the market and for the producers of those foods consumption out of own production. This lesson also notes key mediating factors that affect impact such as women's empowerment and nutrition awareness. It also highlights the importance of a multi-chain approach since we know that one food can't solve all the nutrition problems but thinking about how to improve the diet as a whole could make a difference. Finally, the lesson examines some of the strengths, challenges, and tension among actions in an SFVCN approach, focusing on increasing economic value for producers, traders, and other value chain actors may create then a challenge of ensuring that these nutritious foods remain affordable for the poorest, who are likely the ones who need such foods most. The last lesson, goes through the steps and the studies and analyses that are needed to design an SFVCN project. Steps one through four are the diagnostic steps, which through data collection and analyses provide the information needed to put a project together. Step one undertakes a nutrition situation analysis that identifies the nutrition problems faced by the target population. Step two identifies the commodities that have potential to address the nutrition problem while also making business sense. Step three under not, undertakes value chain analyses of those prioritized commodities using a nutrition lens, then identifying constraints and opportunities in supply, demand, and nutrition value. Step four identifies the intervention options that will address these issues and the SFVCN project can invest in. Step five then takes all these results into account and puts the elements of the project together. This process helps to unpack the complexity of food systems, of value chains and nutrition 
to systematically identify which commodities and interventions hold the greatest potential to meet concerns about nutrition, as well as concerns about business profitability and improvements in livelihoods. And so help you to determine which projects to invest in when developing a value chain project that also aims to improve nutrition. As we started from the as we stated from the outset, value chain development projects are themselves an important approach to development. They help to focus attention and investment on particularly vulnerable populations, such as smallholders, and can empower them, make production and the overall value chain and food system more efficient and improve their incomes and livelihoods. Most value chain projects, however, focus on raising incomes and respond to, without necessarily trying to change, market demand. In this approach, we are adding, as shown in these diagrams about step one, step four on the diagnostics and step five about how to put the project together, adding concerns about nutrition to a typical value chain approach at each step. We start with consumer concerns in terms of a healthy diet rather than focusing solely on the producer or market analysis. But we also recognize that a viable project must still appeal to producers, traders, and other value chain actors and provide them attractive options that will increase their incomes and improve their livelihoods. And so while we look at commodity selection through a nutrition lens, we also have added the requirement that actions should do no harm to the environment or to women's status and empowerment. The course and the guides explain how to go through this process with specific analyses and a scoring process to find those commodities that hold the greatest potential for value chain development on all three counts, income, market demand, and nutrition. The course provides a clear overview of these steps, but they are described in detail in these two publications available from EFAD and A4NH on how to design nutrition sensitive value chain projects. These should be complemented with especially information from the course and FAO to further bring in the concepts of sustainability and gender. Now I wanna quickly highlight some of the useful and exciting features of this course. For example, not only does it outline a process, but it gives information on a range of topics. It provides citation of sources and additional references, and it's interactive so you, you can pursue some of the topics in even more detail. There are also quizzes, and as Christine and Florence mentioned, there's an opportunity to, which can allow you to achieve a certification, and this badge can then be shown to be part of your professional qualification for example, on your CV. The course also highlights, in addition, we have Leticia Naya Nassim here to guide you through the course, providing additional information along the way, and also illustrating each step with the real world application of the steps using their own country situation. But at the end of the day, can you really use what you, you learn in this course? It may seem a little bit complex at first, but we developed the guides underlying this course through a partnership between EFAD and A4NH and a project funded by the governments of Germany and Canada, and practical use by managers and project designers was first in mind. In developing those guides, we took an experimental and research-based approach, and we had the partner organizations working with us try and test the steps and tools alongside EFAD-funded government projects in the field. Food Basket Foundation International and the Netherlands Royal Tropical Institute worked in Nigeria, and SV, S, SVN and SIAT worked in Indonesia with us. The most appropriate methods and tools were then included in the guides. The field experiences showed that even in these situations, adequate secondary information was often available and, needed primary, and the needed primary data could be collected relatively easy. So as I said, the aim was to have a rigorous and research-based approach to design, however, producing reliable, valid, and replicable results, but also that we needed to have tools and methods that were practical and feasible for use in the field, in settings where time, money, and capabilities are often limited. But remember, for these kinds of projects, you often need project, not research level position, precision. So you need to know, for example, is vitamin A deficiency a problem? You don't need to know whether it's 15% or 20% in terms of prevalence. 
We also, as I said, tested these approaches alongside actual agricultural value chain projects in Indonesia and Nigeria. And these approaches and methods and tools, ideas, were then validated in workshops by national and global experts, holding workshops in both Nigeria and Ni in Indonesia, and then also a global workshop. And I appreciate the fact that some of the people who participated in those workshops are online. We looked at how much total time this kind of an approach may take. Um, we think a reasonable amount that could be shortened for various reasons is probably four to six months, which is about in line with the normal project development process. But really only step one, the nutrition situation analysis is an addition to what most project design for value chain projects do anyway. The rest is just adding a nutrition lens to work that should be done in any case. Notice that most of this also relies on secondary data that, are already, that is already available, complemented by primary data collection with easy tools to fill the gaps. So lastly, the resources to help you to implement the concepts developed in this course are available. Here are some of the key resources that can be found on the EFAD, FAO, and A4NH websites. As already mentioned, there are two volumes from EFAD, A4NH on how to design NSVC projects, complemented further here with attention to sustainability and gender using resources from FAO. Other resources, including related e-learning courses from FAO Academy are listed in the course as well. As I noted, the two volumes on project design specify already what information you will need, terms of reference for consultant and staff, specific data sources and methods for each step, and in volume two, actual tools for primary data collection, such as key informant interviews, other questionnaires, and those volumes are linked at each step. Um, the EFAD A4NH also has a research paper which outlines the review of literature and the framework, as well as country finding briefs. And in other words, those were the country results that are put into an easily this digestible format and shows what you get when you actually use this approach. So you can see that there's a lot of information that we drew on to develop this course and it's all easily accessible. Before ending, I want to thank especially Isabel de la Peña of IFAD who worked with me to develop the IFAD guides and other materials mentioned here and who also worked on this course. And also David Nevin at FAO for his work on sustainable food value chains and others at FAO for their work on developing the guiding framework for gender sensitive value chains. And I want to thank specifically also the overall project coordinators for the development of this course, Florence and Christina, and co-lead author Andrea, as well as the co-authors Isabel, Bean, Ayrosana, and Elvira, and also Cleona, Peter, Lavinia for their patient support and brilliance in putting together the design, the animation, and the ARC course together. Of course, many of the others also contributed their insights work and time, most especially the members of the RBA Working Group on Sustainable Food Value Chains for Nutrition, and others coming from FAO, EFAD, and WFP, and also those who attended the various workshops needed to put together. So you can tell the few faces that you see here don't do justice to all of the other people who really put in their effort to develop this course, and we greatly appreciate it. Thanks to everyone, and I hope you enjoy the course. Thank you, thank you very much, James. And um, I would like now to give the floor to uh, um, Custodio uh, Mukavele and Carla Honwana um, for um, showing us a little bit, um, giving us a little bit of country uh, case study from, uh, from Mozambique. So we have uh, an idea of how it works directly in country. The floor is yours, you have 10 minutes. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you, Christina, and thank you to the organizers of this uh, webinar. I want also to uh, thank to, to Antonella for, from IFA for inviting us in the field, for inviting us in Mozambique to share our contribution on the mainstreaming nutrition intervention, interventions in the portfolio in Mozambique with case studies from our market linkage project, uh, Promel. I'm doing this presentation uh, together with the, um, Carla Oman, who is the project coordinator for Promer. I will take this um, first bit quickly with the introduction remarks, and Carla will take it over to present concrete cases from, 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 from the project. 
maybe as a starting point, I would like to bring your attention to, to the nutrition situation in Mozambique, uh, as indicated in the three maps there. And you can see in three, um, three dimensions, uh, the chronic malnutrition, food security, and agricultural productivity. You can see uh, clearly that there is a um, um, kind of a, um, uh, Sorry, Custodio, to interrupt you. Can you mention province? You see that they are more productive, and the food security is good in northern province. And in the at the same time, they are the they have the, the highest problems of chronic malnutrition. So that tells us that there is something that the, needs to be done with this uh, negative correlation, if you like, between productivity and malnutrition. Uh, next slide. Sorry. The, the presentation with, with what you're saying because we are still on the first screen basically. We, we yeah, you have to go on presentation mode. Just click on the presentation mode. It's a small icon on the right hand side uh, on the, uh, down on your screen and then maybe synchronize the excellent and then uh, yes. Is, is, that, is, that, is that okay now? Now it's perfect. Thank you. Okay, apologies. No, I was talking on this and uh, this slide, which which gives the, the the agriculture productivity, food security, and chronic malnutrition. So you can see that in the north of Mozambique is good agriculture productivity, but at the same time, it's the same province I have malnutri chronic malnutrition um, problem. So it tells us there is a lot of uh, work to be done with regards to addressing the uh, malnutrition or chronic malnutrition in those provinces. Now, uh, the next slide is, gives you the policy and the uh, strategic approach, which is a combination of government interventions uh, with, with, through multi-sectoral plan for reduction of chronic malnutrition uh, with the UN agenda for the reduction of chronic malnutrition. Uh, this is the important combination, we believe, because this is the combination that shows how important is malnutrition. malnutrition. And at the same time, I bring uh, some core indications on uh, related to malnutrition of the 16 core indications, and I try to highlight five on which IFAD is uh, actually more active. The next slide shows the uh, basically I bring the next slide to show the how the path in terms of malnutrition uh, um, uh, man, mind streaming in Mozambique starting from 2012 with Japan, which was a small, a small grant on, on HIV and nutrition to assist people living with the HIV to improve their diets. Uh, from that end, we started to improve and the, basically, um, I think the boost was in 2013 with the, um, the MDG uh, 1C um, uh, program, which was uh, support uh, from, supported by EU funds and the three RBAs uh, organizations were implementers in Mozambique. From that end, then we basically, we looked at, the, we tried to mainstream nutrition throughout all the projects. In 2015, we did with the extension projects. In 2016, we added some more resource to Propesca and Promer. And then 2018, we did uh, on a ProSul, a new project, a value chain project also. Uh, it did some in intervention in nutrition. 2017, Promer had more funds to go to work on nutrition. And finally, in 2018, the design of the new projects that are now coming uh, to start, we have the, with the man mainstream of nutrition is, is, is basically uh, fully, fully done in, 20, in 2018. So all the projects in Mozambique now are fully mainstream in terms of malnutrition. The last slide basically shows uh, the scaling up of, my, of, uh, of nutrition from 2012 to 2019. And it shows basically, once again, what uh, I indicated before, in 2013 with funds from EU is when basically we start to scale up throughout the country. Thank you, Andy. I'll, I'll, I'll hand it over to Carla to, to, to do the second bit of presentation. Thank you, Custodio. Before we go to Carla, can, you, can I please ask you again to go on presentation mode because you are showing a slideshow. So I see that some people are asking us to make sure that the presentation is shown. Hello, can you hear me? 
Yes, we can hear you. I was just asking if you could make sure that the presentation is on full screen, because I see some comments from participants asking for that. So please just close this slideshow and then click again on the full screen uh, presentation modality. It's, yes. It's, it's good, yes. Is it now okay? No, now this is, this is the normal uh, PowerPoint file. You can click on the last icon before the minus symbol on the bottom right. Otherwise, it's also on the on the up uh, upside to the left. No. Is that okay now? Yes, now it's okay. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Carla. Check out. Hello. Thank you. <clears throat> can you hear me? Yes. Okay, so thank you, Custodio, and also thank you, uh, organizers, for giving us the opportunity of presenting our experience, of sharing our experience in how to mainstream nutrition in uh, a, 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 a market linkage program. Uh, I would like to start by giving a short background information about the program. Uh, so it's a market linkage program. Sorry, we are having some technical problems. Okay. So it's a market linkage program and um, the goal is to improve the livelihoods of the poor rural households by enabling small scale farmers to increase their income from agricultural activities. Uh, the target group are small scale farmers and rural traders. And uh, the program is being implemented in 15 districts of four provinces of Mozambique. And uh, these four provinces are the ones that Custodio referred that the ones that have higher problems of chronic malnutrition. It is a 12 year duration program with, which will close in 2021. Uh, Promer was originally a seven year project and it was designed to address the main problems in different value chain segments. But uh, when it was designed, there was no specific nutrition focus. So the project interventions from 2009 to 2013 were basically uh, focused on input supply, production, processing, and marketing. So the, the activities included facilitating linkages between rural traders and input supplies, uh, capacity building of farmers' organization, uh, demonstration fields for improved technology, promotion of small-scale value addition, uh, support the development of agribusiness processing capacities and also uh, some interventions in uh, improvements of the environment, so rehabilitation of access roads, facilitating access to finance, etc. In terms of uh, implementing nutrition activities, we can say that Promare had two phases. So the first phase was from 2014 to 2018. Uh, sorry. Sorry, the first phase was from 2014 to 2018 when uh, nutrition education was integrated in the program as part of the MDG1 program funded by the European Union. During this phase, nutrition was implemented as a standalone component. Uh, it was implemented in only one of the four provinces that were covered by the project. It targeted uh, 3,000 women uh, at reproductive age and children under two years and adoles adolescents. The entry points were the farmers' organizations and secondary schools. And the main activities included nutrition awareness, cooking demonstration, 
uh, establishment of communi uh, community and school gardens and uh, <clears throat> and nutrition messages being broadcasted through community radios. So the focus in this first in this first phase was in the demand side, the consumption. So the project was actually focusing its activities in the last segment of the value chain. Now, in 2018, uh, an impact study was done to assess the, the impacts of, of the first phase. And uh, the results showed that 40% uh, of women of reproductive age, 68% of adolescents and 45% of children under two years achieved the minimum dietary diversity. Uh, from this first phase, the main lesson that was learned was that primary interventions offers a wide range of opportunities for nutrition outcomes. So in that sense, nutrition education implemented as a standalone component and focused in the end of the value chain has limited the results and the impact. <clears throat> In 2018, PROMER received additional financing from IFAD and uh, the program was extended to until 2021. And so we took this opportunity to scale up nutrition activities to the whole project area. So we went from five districts in one province to 15 districts in four provinces. And based on the lessons learned, from phase one, we change to a nutrition sensitive value chain approach. So the main issue to be addressed in this second phase was how a market linkage program can deliver positive nutrition outcomes to smallholder farm families, while at the same time aiming for income increase from production. So we basically provided technical and functional skills to project technical staff. We developed support materials and guidance notes to support each component to mainstream nutrition. We carried out the baseline survey, survey to find out the nutrition situation in the program area. And based on the results of this baseline, we adjust the program activities and indicators to make sure that all program intervention in the different segments of the value chain were nutrition sensitive and focus on further increasing the nutrition food production and utilization of nutrition food within the farmers organization value chains. So the new approach consisted in identifying and making good use of the opportunities to en enhance supply and demand of specific foods as a way to address the nutrition problems of the target population. So with this approach, the idea is to mainstream nutrition in both the supply and the demand side of the value chain, considering all value chain segments. In terms of activities in, in this uh, second phase, uh, the active, primary activities are focused in the supply side. We have the promotion of the sale of dark green leafy vegetable seeds and other vegetable seeds rich in vitamin A and zinc, including biofortified orange fleshed sweet potato. We also promote, are promoting uh, the improved varieties, early mature, and the use of organic fertilizers and pesticides. And the food for production, we are uh, doing aware, uh, awareness sensitization sessions of selected nutrition, nutritious dense commodities at farmers organizations, district and provincial meetings, rural traders and agribusinesses. Uh, we are also promoting nutrition sensitive extensions. So we are working with the extension services and promoting nutrition sensitive extensions. 
In terms of storage and processing, we are investing in safe storage warehouse and other infrastructure. Uh, in processing of rural fortification, uh, specifically fortified maize flowers. And we are also promoting uh, sesame, groundnut, and soya oil processing. Uh, in terms of distribution and transport, uh, the rehabilitation of more than 700 kilometers of feeder roads with access to key production centers the investments in transport means and the creation of diversified distribution channels make a contribution to nutrition. Uh, trading and marketing, we are constructing safe wholesale and retail markets, supporting the packaging and labeling of products and ensuring the signature of future contracts between farmers organizations and rural traders. On the demand side, uh, so we are promoting nutrition education on, on food groups, diet, diet diversification, uh, SBCC, dissemination of nutrition uh, messages in local radios. Uh, we are also investing in cooking demonstration, promotion of good hygiene practices, and promotion of processing and conservation of nutritious food. So in conclusion, we can say that the project went from a market linkage programs without any nutrition, nutrition focus to a market linkage program with a nutrition component focus on the last segment of the value chain. And finally, we are at a stage where we are a nutrition sensitive market linkage program with nutrition sensitive activities in both supply and demand side. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, thank you very much for this case study. Thank you uh, for, uh, to both uh, Carla and Custodio. Um, as you know, we are going to move now towards the Q&A session where the questions of our participants uh, will be answered, some of the questions of course, will be answered by, by, by the experts. Uh, I would like to ask, uh, we will be we will be asking uh, um, the different uh, speakers to respond to a few questions. Uh, you will be having uh, about five minutes to respond, and I would like to give the floor to uh, to start with Florence, uh, so that you can answer a few of the questions that were uh, posed to you by the participants. You have about five minutes before we move on to to James. Florence, uh, the floor is yours. Yes, thank you very much, Christina. So uh, looking broadly at the questions, uh, there were uh, at the beginning question about uh, if uh, small farmers and, uh, and poverty reduction uh, um, objectives were targeted. Uh, and the, the answer is yes, obviously you saw now with the presentation of Mozambique that our main targets are value chains where uh, smallholders are involved and uh, where the, the objective is really to make uh, more supply on nutritious food available uh, but also to increase the income small, for small farmers and to, to reduce poverty. So it's really interesting in this approach because normally you are, you are uh, targeting or either the uh, one or the other but uh, it's, uh, it's not uh, uh, so evident that uh, you could address both. And what, it's what we are trying to do with, with uh, this approach, where we are looking mainly our, uh, our, uh, at value chains for national markets, uh, value chain for consumers, uh, national consumers, uh, value chain even for uh, poor consumers, or let's say uh, in uh, um, with limited access to, to nutritious food and how we can uh, make with a, a more efficient value chain that this food will be available for the consumer. So we are trying to address all along the value chain. We, you saw also in, in, in the presentation from Mozambique different um, intervention from uh, the roads uh, to the processing, uh, schools, etc. So there is a whole range of, uh, 
of uh, interventions and possibilities uh, that uh, could be taken into account. So it's, it's not uh, something that we can do all the same everywhere. It's just some kind of menu where you have to adapt uh, looking at the situation. But um, it, it's the idea of this methodology to be quite flexible, but to put nutrition in the center of the, of the approach. There is also one question about uh, if uh, the approach could be applying also for issues of, uh, of malnutrition in the sense of obesity and, um, and uh, countries where we have uh, uh, issues with uh, people consuming too, too much uh, certain food and having a, 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 bad, uh, a bad nutrition uh, habits. And in this case, we, we can also do it, for example, by uh, promoting more, uh, for example, fruit and vegetable value chains. Uh, and we are now entering in the next year will be the international year of fruit and vegetable. And, and we are seeing that fruit and vegetable are not produced enough in enough quantity and at the price that is accessible for all consumer to uh, be able to feed uh, all the population with enough uh, fruit and vegetable as the recommendation of uh, WHO is, is uh, recommending. So there is a, a, um, an opportunity, a huge opportunity for small farmers and, uh, and small holders to contribute to, for example, increasing the production uh, in a more efficient way of fruit and vegetable for national markets uh, in general. So I, I will leave it uh, uh, here for the, the question I, I managed to see. Uh, maybe James and uh, the other yes. panelists can complement. Thank you. Thank you. So James, uh, you have the floor uh, and uh, you could uh, uh, start answering some of the questions. Thank you, Christina. Yeah, there's a bunch of questions. So uh, as Fabio said, we will also try to later at least provide some some brief answers to all the questions, um, if I don't get to your questions here. Um, there were a few questions about where the different agencies are working, uh, Ethiopia or Eastern Africa, et cetera. I will let the other agencies speak for themselves, but I think all of us work in, in all regions, Africa, Asia, Latin America, uh, and there are similar interesting projects and support for this uh, wherever we work. Uh, in Ethiopia, for example, A4NH has a, has a, has a strong presence. Um, and also we have a strong presence in Kenya and Nigeria. Um, uh, there were questions about how this might be used and what kinds of, um, what kinds of successful case studies. And I believe Marion Odenegmo is still on the line. Uh, and she was instrumental in providing technical assistance in terms of particularly East and Southern Africa for EFAD in terms of nutrition. So maybe she has something to say specifically about other projects there. And Isabel as well, uh, de La Peña is online. And I know that they have, EFAD has tried to, uh, to adapt this approach, to use this approach in Vietnam and Bolivia and Mauritania, in Honduras and Bangladesh. So there are some interesting experiences that are coming out of that, as well as Mozambique that we just heard about. Um, there was a question about how do you address, for example, the challenges, some of the major challenges, for example, around policy, around food safety standards, et cetera. Um, I think something that, that, that hopefully you got out of the presentation, but also something that Florence was saying is that this is an approach. You can take, you can apply this to any country, you can apply it to, to, to whatever your particular context is, um, if those are issues. For example, step three, which is about how do you do your standard, gen, what would be typically a value chain analysis, which would talk about where are the constraints, where are the bottlenecks, where are the opportunities. So you still apply those kinds of analyses that would indeed look at what are the challenges around the policy environment, the enabling environment, as well as, for example, food safety standards. That was one of the things that came through, for example, in Nigeria, where they talked a lot about the way that products were being, uh, that were being shipped from farm gate to the market to consumers. Um, so one is the analysis. And then the next step, of course, is to hold, for example, 
in, in, in Indonesia, they held a workshop, an implementation workshop, that then would I, that would talk about these identified problems and what the potential solutions are, that then the project itself could, could take up. So I think it's mostly just thinking about what the process is, and of course, the flexibility, as uh, Florence said, to be able to address the, the different issues as they come up. This also would be, for example, the question that is about what can you do about uh, smallholders being involved? What can you do about post-harvest loss? I would just point out that this particular framework was developed from a smallholder's perspective, and EFAD has smallholders really as their primary clients beneficiaries of their projects. So there's lots of experience within EFAD as well as support from, from, w, from FAO in terms of how to work with smallholders. And there are some, um, some key examples then, particularly around value chains, because around 80% of EFAD's portfolio is around the development of value chains specifically for smallholders. Um, I think a really key question, and I'm not going to attempt to answer this, but I will throw it out there for those of you who are working in the field, is that how might you carry out this kind of an approach during lockdown? Because we did, you can do some of the secondary data collection, probably, uh, but it would be difficult, I would think, to go to the field, but I think some countries are different than others. And I know that EFAD is continuing to work in terms of project design, and it would be interesting to know, know how they do that. Um, there were also the, the final question that I will, will, will talk about is um, a question about whether this kind of an approach making value chains nutrition sensitive also addresses issues around obesity and NCDs um, and addresses the environmental considerations. And Florence talked about that a little bit. I would just say that again, this was developed particularly in terms of sort of an, a, a smallholder centric kind of project in mind, but there's no reason I don't think that you couldn't apply the same steps. And in fact, I would think that the food, different food councils in different, in different cities particularly also think about how do they understand the nutrition problems, the dietary problems? How do we have a territorial approach to link urban with rural areas and the small and the different producers in those areas, and certainly then to, to, to bring healthier foods to the market for, for the different consumers. Um, EFAD has addressed uh, environmental considerations in a lot of its projects through uh, a long-standing project that looks at climate change and climate resilience. There's a publication that talks about nutrition and the role of uh, and the role of this particular kind of approach in terms of addressing climate. I would also say that CCAFS, which is the Climate Change and Food Security Research Program of, of, of CGIR, addresses a lot of these environmental and sustainability issues, as well as does the World Business Council on Sustainable Development. And one of the things that we've also been involved in all of us is the uh, is the development of the voluntary guidelines for on food systems for nutrition, which tries specifically to infuse considerations about nutrition into the whole food system. And those guidelines are now being developed by the Committee on World Food Security and should be approved next February. Um, and I think those are some of the more specific aspects of how do you address putting nutrition into the food system. And there is, of course, the high level panel of experts report on that particular topic that was that came out uh, last year thanks okay thank you yeah indeed as uh, james was mentioning um on the fao e-learning academy uh, there will be all the information of these webinars so you will have access to the the videos you will have access to the presentations that you will be able to download and you will also have um access to um, a Q&A document where the, the experts that were involved uh, in, uh, in this webinar will be providing uh, the answers to your questions. But uh, before uh, we conclude, I would like to ask Carla and Custodio to respond to some of the questions that were um, related to, uh, to the case study of Mozambique. So the floor is yours. Well, thank you. Hello, thank you. Can you hear me? Yes, yes, very well. Uh, thank you, and once again, thank you for the, this opportunity, for uh, giving us this opportunity. Uh, the 10 minutes, it's always, uh, it's always a challenge, and especially when you have an um, audience like this for a topic like nutrition, it's, it's, it's really a, a challenge. 
My, I have seen a, a number of questions. We've seen several questions and comments on our presentations, um, and we find them um, helpful. Maybe in trying to select one or two questions to deal with, uh, deal with them at this stage. One question that I, I, like, I would like to, to take is this related to the demand. How do we increase the demand of nutritious um, uh, diets? I, I think this is, uh, is, can be done in, in, in a number of ways, but perhaps the, the, the most, in, most important way is to deal with the, is to, is to, is to, is to do, deal with it through nutrition uh, education. Yeah? I think this is what the IFAD, in the IFAD projects we have been doing over the last um, years or so, in, in investing in nutrition education. And just to give you an example, uh, for example, when people are promoting gardens, sometimes they take the produce from the gardens and they sell and they go and buy food that are not nutritious. This is something that shows to us that the education is needed to be, I mean, um, further you know, um, improved to ensure that people understand the value of uh, the food that is coming from their gardens. One other thing, that other question that came is related to the use of schools in terms of disseminating the message. Yes, again, it's a combination of methods. We use extension service, but at the same time, we, we do use the schools um, in, the, in promoting the, and the, 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 the message uh, about the nutrition. And we, we all know the value that the schools present in terms of having young people who easily adopt some of these messages, and then they can take, and then they can use the use it to teach um, to, 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 to teach the older people in their, in their, in their families. I will leave uh, to Carla maybe for one or two um, the comments of the questions of, that we have. I, I think we can deal with those questions, some of these, those questions later on in writing. Thank you and over to you, Carla. Thank you. I hope you can hear me. I'm going to answer, yes, I'm going to answer to a couple of questions. One of the questions, I think it's a very important, it brings a very important issue, which is the issue of sustainability. Um, in our case, specifically, we are going to the end of the project. So the project is going to close in 2021. So of course, sustainability is one of our major concerns, how to make sure that all these investments, all these positive uh, results that we, we got uh, can be consolidated and can continue after the project closure. And first of all, we'd like to say that we believe that investing in behavior changing, it's very challenging, but it is in itself an element of sustainability. Because once people change the way they do things, the tendency is that they will continue. Now, we have, for instance, some examples in the, the communities that refer that uh, the beneficiary says that introducing improved hygiene and sanitation measures and providing children with enriched porridge, which was introduced by the project, they noticed that the children had less frequent diarrheas. So this means that they are seeing an advantage in doing this. So they are not just doing it because the project said so. They see an advantage, a very, a very, a very clear advantage in the health of their children. So there is no reason they will stop doing it because the project is not there. So this is just an example. The second element of sustainability is that we made sure that throughout the both phases, we, we had a very strong involvement of the government at, at, from the district, the province, and also at national level. So technicians from all the relevant sectors of the government were involved in the training, they were involved in the planning, and they were involved in the monitoring activities. So we think that this is also an element of sustainability. Uh, the other thing that we think that it's, it's important to guarantee the sustainability is what Custodio mentioned, that uh, 
we have some new projects that are funded by IFAX in the same project area. So it, geographically, uh, there is a coincidence of these projects. And all these new projects, they were uh, designed with a nutrition sensitive lens. So uh, differently from PROMER that was designed in 2008, uh, these new projects, they have a nutrition sensitive lens. So we hope that they can continue the work that was started by PROMER. So this is some of the elements of sustainability oh. that we think that will somehow make sure that all this investment is not going to be lost. The other thing that also I would also like to mention is that at local level, the communities where we were working, we always made sure that we had some activists, community activists. And these activists, uh, they, they continue to work. Uh, they are working, you know, they are spreading, they are disseminating the message, they are doing nutrition education. They are invited by the, you know, by, by, by the government whenever there is a trade fair or there is some event at the district level to make the hooking demonstration. To, 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 to disseminate the work. They also work in health centers. Um, they go and, and they do these uh, sessions, awareness sessions in health centers. So we think that uh, uh, all these are elements that are going to guarantee somehow the sustainability of the project. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, Carla. Uh, we are coming to the end of the webinar, but I wanted to mention a few things before. there is also another sorry yes there was also another another question was uh, if the value chain commodity are the one promoted partially for consumption or income from value chain is used for purchasing nutritious foods or general nutrition promotion of food demonstration is done parallel to by the chain activities. Uh, this is a very big question, but uh, basically what, what we can say about this is that what we are doing at local level, we don't work with specific value chains. We are promoting whatever value chain has, as a market linkage project, we are promoting with whatever value chain has potential in the region. So before we introduce this nutrition component and before we introduce this new approach, uh, the focus of course was on the, on the value chains, on the produce that had uh, better markets. And uh, with, with this nutrition, with the introduction, introduction of this new approach, what we do is to make sure that from the planning of what the farmers are going to produce, uh, they start thinking about what it is important in terms of nutrition for them and what it is, or, or, and also how can they uh, sell, not only produce nutrition food, but also sell, you know, and put it in the market. So it's not, as, uh, it, we cannot separate things. This is a market linkage project. So this is, this is our main focus. The only thing we did was to make sure that Within this focus, we take into consideration the nutrition aspects. Thank you. Thank you very much, Carla. And uh, uh, thank you. To, to thank you. And I think I'm going to stop here. Thank you. I, uh, I just wanted to mention uh, a few things. Uh, we are coming, the, the webinar is coming to an end, and I wanted to mention a few things. Uh, the first one was that uh, even uh, James mentioned. Uh, nutrition sense, um, nutrition situation analysis, and I wanted to mention that uh, the FAO eLearning Academy, uh, there are a number of uh, uh, nutrition related courses, and we also have a nutrition situation analysis course that I invite you all to have a look at. And I, we also listed here a number of courses that could be of interest. So first of all, uh, the course that we are promoting uh, here today, which is the Sustainable uh, Food Value Chains for Nutrition. Here you have the, the link, plus uh, Developing Gender Sensitive Value Chains and other courses related to uh, sustainability. So I would like to um, 
to thank all the speakers. I would like to also thank um, our partner, uh, our partner organizers, which are UNSCAP and Agrinium. Uh, I would like special thanks to uh, Aristide Bucare and Fabio Picinic. And of course, all of you, the participants, thank you very much for attending and for your excellent questions. Thank you all very much. Bye bye. Bye bye.